I'll give it a rest, Nathaniel said, kicking a piece of debris from the road into the shrubbery. When was the last time you offered anything but motivational words in the thick of a fight? He laughed and slapped Alan on the shoulder with a heavy hand. What about the Mylurk Queen? Alan countered. You'd have been dead if I didn't drag you out from under it. She was already dead before you came within 20 feet, and I killed the bloody thing while you took notes in your diary. Look, you'd still be suffocating under that thing if it wasn't for me. With these tools, it took me an hour to cut you out, and I didn't have a big steel helmet to block out the foul smell. Some gratitude would be appreciated. Hold up. I think this is it, Alan said, revealing a piece of folded paper from his pocket. He unraveled it and read, The shipment of Radaway was delivered to a hospital in this area, which I believe is just over there. Alan pointed forward. The road ahead was less destroyed and the grasslands gave way to an urban sprawl of buildings, lampposts and bus shelters. Standing up just above the street, they could see a large building with a huge green cross mounted above the door. I'd say that's it. Well done, detective, Nathaniel said. He stopped just outside the front entrance, extending an arm to signal Alan to stay quiet. Ghouls, Nathaniel whispered. The faint sound of feral ghoul cries were just about audible, muffled by the hospital's thick walls. Nathaniel drew his plasma rifle from its holster and padded quietly to the main doors, as quietly as a man could in power armor at least. Let's just get in and grab the stuff. If you can avoid clunking around in your armor too much, we should be able to do it without uh, provoking anything, Alan said, unable to fully stop his concern from leaking into his voice. You've got your gun? Nathaniel asked. Alan nodded, opening his coat to reveal a 10mm pistol. Nathaniel pressed his hand against the door and opened it gently. The door of the old war-torn hospital creaked in protest from the disturbance. The creak echoed into the lobby, making Alan cringe until the sound had passed, and then the silence consumed the hospital once again. All right, Alan, quick and quiet would be the best way to proceed. You take the left wing, and I'll take the right to the staff room and offices, ordered Nathaniel. Alan nodded, and Nathaniel walked towards the offices. He moved gracefully for a man in such a huge tin suit. He always appeared to be in complete control, methodically checking every corner for hostiles. Alan stood for a second watching him leave. It may have been years since he was with the Enclave, but he still maintained the characteristic discipline and professionalism. He was a fantastic specimen. Alan felt the hairs on his neck begin to rise, and he wiped his brow with the back of his sleeve. What was it about this man? And why, despite the countless times I've treated his wounds, have I not dug deeper? to study him in all his magnificence. Nathaniel turned his head back before leaving the lobby into the staff wing and Alan diverted his gaze, reaching for his pistol and stalking in the other direction. The light filtering through the damaged roof of the lobby dimmed as Alan moved into the operating wing corridor. The silence that had been there before seemed heavier now. Maybe it was the absence of Nathaniel's metallic footsteps, or maybe it was the fact that he was now alone, breathing in the stale air of a place that had been deprived of sunlight for God knows how long. Either way, the new silence seemed to swallow the old one whole, interrupted only by Alan's nervous breaths and careful steps. He reached into his bag and withdrew his hand torch. He switched it on, lighting the path with a bright, unwelcome glow. The first door came on the right side of the walkway. Alan approached the small rectangular window on the door and looked inside, angling the torch to illuminate whatever lay inside. There were a row of operating tables, all empty, all smeared with dried blood. There were no storage closets that Alan could see, so he didn't enter, instead continuing along the hallway. The next room on his left was missing a door. He could see two battered hinges in his torch's light. Let's hope nothing tore off this door recently, he thought, smiling anxiously to himself. I'm sure this was just years of wear and tear. Alan stepped into the room. He heard a sudden echo in the far corner of the room and he snapped his torch and pistol in that direction. The spotlight revealed a metal sink. The tap was dripping incessantly, producing an unnerving rhythm. Relax, Alan. You're just getting scared of your own shadow. Alan shook his head and made his way back to the corridor. Past the operating rooms, the wing opened up into the patient's quarters. Beds lined the walls, and thankfully, there were wide windows on each wall, permitting just enough natural light for Alan to get a full view without the harsh light of his torch. Nothing that looked like the supplies. He diverted his gaze to the double doors in the far side of the room. Above the door was a sign that read storage. Alan pressed on, suddenly hopeful that this would in fact be a trouble-free endeavor. He pushed through the doors into an even larger room. There were crates stacked in neat rows, most of which were probably scavenged of supplies long ago, but the shipment of Radaway Alan had caught wind of was supposedly quite recent. Some well-intentioned fools had hoped to return this hospital to working order. The thought of what might have happened to them concerned him, but maybe their sacrifice would not be in vain. 
Allen could save countless lives in the wasteland with those supplies. The rows of crates formed a path through the room, and Alan followed it to the end, checking each box for the evasive rataway. The path came to an abrupt end at the far end of the room, and there were no supplies, none whatsoever. Alan rubbed his temples and released a frustrated groan, and then he heard another groan in response to his, but this one was far more savage. Alan looked up to his left where the sound had come from. Crawling over one of the empty crates was the horrifying visage of a feral ghoul. Its bottom jaw was swaying with each motion, connected to the rest of its face by one strained tendon. Alan raised his gun instinctively and pulled the trigger, demolishing what remained of the hideous thing's face. The ghoul stopped moving, but Alan's fatal mistake only just occurred to him. The gunshot reverberated throughout the hollow storage room. The sound seemed to bounce around the room for an eternity. It wasn't the only sound in the room for long. Savage roars came from every direction, a cacophony of spine-chilling screams from every nook and cranny of the abandoned hospital. Fuck, Alan exclaimed. Forgetting about his failed mission, Alan began sprinting back the way he came. The dimness of the place was far more troublesome now as he needed to move with haste. As he ran, ferals emerged from the shadows, heralding their pursuit with a further deafening cries. Without breaking stride, Alan fired recklessly at any ghoul who came too close. When he made it back to the patient's quarters, he was surprised by another group of ferals. He dispatched two of the closest to the door with well-placed headshots and then burst through the door back into the operating wing corridor. He'd forgotten how dark it was in here, and he'd already put his torch away. He reached into his bag, digging frantically for a torch, continuing to run full speed. He wrapped his hand around the torch and pulls it from the bag. Just as he switched it on, his foot snagged on something in the darkness, and then the floor rushed up to meet him. He landed painfully, not having enough time to free a hand to break his fall. He shone the torch back down the hallway, and as he did, the feral ghoul pounced on him. In the light of the torch, Alan could see the beast's mouth. Its disgusting brown teeth were bared, preparing to take a chunk from Alan's face, but Alan was just about able to hold it at bay with his forearm. He twisted his wrist to point the gun at the creature's temple, and then pulled the trigger. Ch -ch -ch. Empty. He dropped the gun and managed to free a scalpel from his belt while holding the ghoul's face a safe distance from his own. The feral was growing impatient and its jaw snapped shut repeatedly, bellowing sour breath at the doctor. With his free hand, Alan plunged the scalpel deep into the ghoul's head, but to his dismay, it kept thrashing against him. He obviously hadn't breached the thing's skull. Alan was out of ideas and the hope began to drain from him along with his remaining energy. Is this it? Is it over? Oh, what I would give to have my time again and operate on him one more time. Alan's arm was shaking against the weight of the ghoul. Just to cut into him, just to study him. That's all I want, is that so much to ask? Howls resonated down the torch-lit hallway, but Alan couldn't see past the ghoul severely violating his personal space. Alan's desperation turned to acceptance and he started to relax his arm. As he did, the head of the ghoul exploded. Alan's face was showered with viscera. He wiped the blood from his glasses to see Nathaniel standing tall above him. His majestic enclave armor gleamed in the light of the torch. I told you to pack more ammo, Nathaniel said. Under his left arm was a case of supplies. He extended the other to help Alan to his feet. I've got the stuff, now let's go. The hallway changed hue from the yellow-orange of the torch to a fluorescent green. At the end of the corridor stood a glowing one, and behind it stood a horde of feral ghouls. Nathaniel handed the case to Alan and drew his rifle. Firing backwards, they ran towards the exit. Alan led the way while Nathaniel provided cover fire. They rounded a corner and just ahead a ghoul was running at them. Keep moving, Nathaniel shouted. Alan continued running headlong into the oncoming ghoul. As it came into arm's reach, he raised the case of supplies and swung it in its direction. The ghoul's head caved in with a thud, shifting its momentum and sending it barreling into the side of the wall. Alan was operating on pure adrenaline. He could feel his heart pounding in his ears. Behind him, Nathaniel continued to lay down covering fire. The glowing one was taking precious little damage. His shots would collide with it only to burst and cause a brief splash of vivid green light. Nathaniel was an expert at maneuvering in power armor, but he knew it impeded his movement speed. Alan was increasing the distance between them and the glowing one was closing in. If it wasn't for his armor, the radiation would be too intense by now. Nathaniel noticed that there was a significant gap between the chasing glowing one and the trailing horde. He stopped dead in his tracks and holstered his rifle, staring down the oncoming monstrosity. The Geiger counter in his suit was beeping hysterically now. He braced himself, bending his knees and raising his shoulders. When the glowing one neared, it leaped through the air, launching itself at Nathaniel, leaving a stream of translucent radiation in its wake. 
Nathaniel raised his steel-plated arm and caught the beast in mid-air. He gripped the flailing thing by its neck and then with a guttural growl, he slammed it against the wall with all his might. It exploded like a disgusting fleshy balloon erupting into a cascade of liquid radiation. His faded black armor was radiant from the aftermath and as he turned to continue running, he produced his own glowing beacon of light. As he pushed his way into the lobby, he saw Alan holding the front door open for him. He waved Alan away, warning him of the toxic engulfing his armor. He barged through the door and slammed it closed behind him. Alan was sitting on the wall, covering his mouth. With his remaining energy, Nathaniel ripped a street bench from its cracked foundations and planted it in front of the entrance to secure the ghouls inside. Well then, that worked out just fine. Alan turns the open case to face Nathaniel. Inside were stacks of unused Radaway. The glowing, radiated masses of the Commonwealth will be very grateful for this. The two erupted into laughter. That night, the campfire light seemed to burn brighter than it had for years. Alan and Nathaniel sat on adjacent logs, eagerly spooning stale noodles into their mouths. You know, this stuff isn't half bad, Alan said, looking at the packaging of his noodle cup. They seem uh, far less rubbery than usual. You were nearly a ghoul's lunch today, and all you want to do is talk about these dog shit noodles. I don't think I'll really ever understand how that head of yours works, Al. Nathaniel replied. The slight breeze passing through their camp passed, and they were left in a moment of contemplative silence. Alan looked Nathaniel over. He had removed his power armor, leaving it to rest by the fire, and now he sat in only his combat trousers and a thin white undershirt. He didn't have an ounce of excess body fat, and Alan could see the lean muscles and tendons of his arms lightly flex as he twisted his fork in the cup of noodles. And I don't think you really will ever understand, Alan thought to himself. You look troubled. What's up? Alan asked. Uh, nothing really, I just... I just... Wonder if it's worth it sometimes. I mean, will these even help? Did you flush the rads out of a settler just to see them shot by a raider the next day? I just question what I'm doing sometimes. Am I really helping or am I just prolonging their cruel fate? Look, Nathaniel, you, you can't save everyone, do everything, protect all. It just isn't possible. Some are destined for a cruel fate, but who's to say it isn't worthwhile alleviating their pain until they reach that end? I mean, that's what I do. Apply painkillers to help them pass on without suffering. Then there are those who will thrive and benefit from the help of good men like us. You can't simply give up because some may die anyway. I just question whether it's really some dying or most dying, Nathaniel replied. Then why do you do it? Alan countered. Nathaniel seemed startled by the question. His fingers moved subconsciously to the dog tags around his neck, and he ran his thumb over the smooth surface for a long while before responding. I was born into the Enclave. They taught me everything I know. But how far would you go in order to please your superiors? Would you follow orders, even if it meant going against every fiber of your being, if it meant going against everything that you stand for? Alan looked at his feet. He found himself lost for words. I was a renowned, loyal officer. All I did was follow orders. I was rewarded and idolized for doing things my commanders were too afraid to do themselves. They may have given the instructions, but the blood was on my hands. Nathaniel let the dog tags fall from his fingers and then pulled up the neck of his shirt to cover them entirely. I've done horrible things and no amount of good deeds will ever reconcile that. Nathaniel threw his empty cardboard cup into the fire and lowered himself to the ground to look at the night sky. Look, Alan, I'm exhausted. Do you think you could take the first watch? Alan nodded as Nathaniel rested his head and closed his eyes. Alan sat unmoving for a while. They'd been traveling together for two years now, and yet Nathaniel's past was still a mystery to him. Whatever haunts that man must have shook him to the core. Alan hadn't considered that the ex-enclave soldier feared anything, but it seemed clear now that he was running from something. Alan observed him as he slept. His muscled chest rose and fell with each breath, and the worn fabric of the threadbare shirt strained with each inhale. He was the perfect anatomical specimen for Alan's experiments, yet there he lay, unharmed. Alan flattened the taut hairs on the back of his neck with the palm of his hand, and then wiped the cold sweat against his coat. He turned his attention back to the case of Radaway and smiled, before leaning back to look at the stars, unaffected by the plights of those wandering aimlessly in this deadly wasteland.